I've spent the last two days doing interviews for the Dutch and Flemish press on Going Dutch. And so you're getting today, this evening, even before Russell engages with me, uh, a slightly different uh, viewpoint on this book from the one that obviously I took when I wrote it um, from a, a very British, in a very British context, um, uh, with a very British sense um, of uh, uh, a need for the British to begin to come to terms with fading empire. And uh, what I, I loved about the Dutch story and the way I wanted to tell it for the British, as I partly explained in my introduction, was that at the very moment that Russell described the luscious high point of the golden age of Dutch art and culture, the economy was stagnating. The imperial dream was collapsing. It took another 50 years for that to be registered and another 50 years again for it fully to be borne in on the Dutch people that their place at the table was gone, the political, international political table. But my sense is that that is where Britain finds herself today. And the optimism, because I'm the optimistic message of this book is that at that moment at which all the things that political, diplomatic, and economic historians regard as the markers of success for a territory, it's too early to call it a nation state, its culture in all its rich diversity, its art, its gemstones, its gardens, its music, its science, its technology, its clockmaking, set out on a global journey, and they set out through Britain, largely via Britain, but that the outcome of this journey was a permanent presence of Dutch culture in European life and certainly in British life, which is, has not only survived but flourished three decades and more after that golden age. So a place at the top table she may no longer have, but a place, a permanent place in the rich and continuing development of European culture she has. And you can hear, so I hope you take to get that message. So I, I, I would like to think that in 350 years time, a little Chinese boy might pick up a very British object and have it explained to him by his teacher that once Britain had an enormous empire, but now she just makes plates, you know. <laughs> um, now, th that is not what I, the way I present the book, because m I'm a storyteller. Um, I, I tell stories. I tell stories out of what uh, somebody introducing me yesterday, I find it irresistible to quote, called um, a tenderness for the past, which makes me want to communicate it to people in the present and allow it to project us, really, into an optimistic future. So I thought that what I would do um, was to give you an unexpected little story from the book, although this, it's not in the book in the form in which I'm going to try and give it to you. And I'll only look at it on paper um, because it has dates in it, and I'm notoriously slap happy with dates in my verbal storytelling, never, never on the page. But if the story is going well, I'm not going to pause to decide whether it was 1641 or 1642, and someone in the audience will definitely tell me so. On the screen here, so I'm going to tell you a story um, about the two, the complicated to and fro of culture in the mid 17th century between the Netherlands and Britain, which may give you a bit of a taste of to how, how um, densely interwoven they are. This is no simple story of travelers carrying riches in their knapsacks. These travelers go back and forth and the objects go back and forth and their cost and their interpretation gets assimilated and identified at either end. And as I say, here is one little story. Hoping I can see the slide from here. Um, the, 
This is the family, uh, we think, of the Sephardic art lover and entrepreneur in Antwerp, Gaspar Duarte. Um, there's a clergyman in the picture because all nice Jewish families in this period, even though allowed to practice, included a clergyman to show that they were open-minded um, uh, or, you know. Um, his family, uh, Gaspar's family had come to Antwerp as refugees from Lisbon. They're part of a large, large cohort of financial men um, who move in uh, after the expulsion from Portugal and establish themselves in Antwerp and in Amsterdam, but I'm particularly interested in Antwerp just because more work has been on an Amst done in Amsterdam. And for those of you who are bothered by the fact that Antwerp belongs now in Belgium, um, uh, Antwerp was the Freeport gateway um, for the Northern Netherlands to territories where, importantly in this period, um, the, Stuart Royal Stuart fam the Stuart Royal family uh, were in exile. Um, and uh, here is the, a useful picture by Van Dyck. On the left is Mary Stuart, who married William II of Orange. Um, uh, next to her is James, Duke of York, who became James II, and in the middle with his enormous dog is Charles, who became Charles II. And in exactly this period, um, uh, th th there's an enormous mingling in Antwerp, and I count it as being part of the, uh, the, the United Provinces network, um, because of such it was. Um, so in 16, no, I'm gonna, not going to do that. I'm going to skip all of that, because I like talking more than reading. Um, in March 1641, Gaspar Duarte wrote to Sir Constantine Huygens, I shall call him, all Dutch present, I, forgive me, it's Huygens, um, all English presents, it's Huggins. Um, it's the French who've lumbered us with Huygens. Uh, he was known as Mr. Huggins, H-U-G-G-I-N-S in uh, Britain throughout the period, as was his son Constantine, who was the secretary to William III. Constantine Sr. was secretary to F Frederick Hendrick um, and then to William II. Um, uh, Duarte wrote a letter in French, which is about a lot of musical small talk, exchanging the scores of Italian songs for one or more voices, and is part of a correspondence between erudite and educated and musical and artistic men who are all pretending to be men of leisure whilst being, in Constantine's case, a major diplomatic figure, and in Duarte's case, a gem dealer. Above all, a gem dealer, though he also deals in paintings, but a dealer of a kind um, that we're familiar with still today, whose home is full of great works uh, on a Saturday night, and if you come back on Monday, you can buy them. <laughs> Duarte writes to let Huygens, Huygens sorry, know that as requested by Re Representative Frederick Hendrick, Duarte's son Jacob in London, who is a jeweler acting for the Duarte, so he's acting for his father's jewelry firm, gem firm in London, um, and the Duarte gem firm had been adopted by Charles the First, we're in um, uh, 41, before the, just before the civil wars break out, um, the Duarte family had also been appointed jewellers to uh, Charles I. So uh, Jacob Duarte from London uh, writes saying he's located a particularly striking and extremely expensive piece of jewellery, an elaborate brooch in the latest fashionable style, which comprises four individual diamonds in a complicated setting designed to be worn on the stomacher of a woman's dress. And we have... That's Constantine Huygens in the very familiar picture from the National Gallery in London with his clerk. And this is the piece of jewelry. I'll come back to it in this setting in a moment. But in, uh, meanwhile, I, I'm going to show you two versions of such a piece of jewelry and paintings by Rubens, who you see here. Um, a Rubens gave his second wife such a piece of jewelry to be worn on her stomacher, that is, on the front, you know, she's laced in tight, flat, no brassiers in that day, those days, and uh, on the front, the, uh, this enormous piece of jewelry is put, which in 
the case of the piece that Rubens gave his wife as a wedding present is attached by all sorts of um, um, other bits of, of chain. Um, there it is again, it's easier to see, clearer to see there, but it's the same piece, and this is another portrait of his wife. It emerges from the letter that the piece of jewellery is to be a sensational gift from Frederick Hendrick's teenage son, William, who was 14, to his bride-to-be, Charles I's nine-year-old daughter, Mary Stuart, on the occasion of their marriage in London that May. They started young. <laughs> He wasn't allowed to sleep with her till she was 12, right? But they could get married when she was nine. Um, Duarte in Antwerp tells Huygens that he has the p identified the perfect piece, and I quote the letter. One of my friends has asked me for an important jewel worth 80,000 florins on behalf of the Prince of Orange. I've delivered a pattern of a rich jewel a fortnight ago. So far, I've received no response. So your cousin advised me it would be a good thing if I let you know about it so that you could alert his highness not to buy any other piece of equivalent value till he's seen this one. It's in London in my son's hands who, if I instruct him to do so, will bring it to him. For the four, diamonds in the four diamonds in combination in this piece have the impact of a single diamond of the value of a million florins. On the 7th of April... Jacob Duarte arrived in Antwerp with the jewel in his pocket, presumably, would be the safest way to carry it. And the following day, Huygens examined it. A fortnight later, Huygens carried it in his own pocket um, to, sorry, so, so Duarte took it to Antwerp, to the family home. Uh, Huygens, who is in Antwerp to collect it, takes it back to the Hague. Um, but the offer the statholder made for the piece was too low. Duarte then suggested that he had actually shown this piece to the English king, and the English king had also taken a liking to it, and the English king had offered 25,000 florins, but he was going to offer it to Frederick Hendrick for the knockdown price of 20,000, and wouldn't that be wonderful, because it was a piece of jewellery that the bride's father had already admired, and that clinched the deal. These exchanges present us with the intriguing picture of a luxury object whose value, financially and in terms of current taste, is being established, but with reference to its desirability in two locations, in two cultures, in two fashionable societies. The Dutch Stadthouder needs a gift which will impress the English king. His agent, who works for both kings, Stadthouder and king, identifies a suitable jewel, which is all in, actually in London. It gets acquired by a Dutch diamond dealer who brings it back to Antwerp. The piece has already been admired by the English king. And on the 19th of April, 1641, Prince William arrived. Uh, that in, that's the piece. That's the marriage. There's the picture. Can you see that's the... Can you see the piece on Little Mary's front? This is in the Rijksmuseum, this painting. On the 19th of April, William arrived with an entourage of 250 people at Gravesend for his wedding, and a few days later, he presented members of the royal party at Whitehall Palace with jewellery worth close to £23,000, including this spectacular piece that, she, that uh, Mary wears on the front of her wedding dress here. And to my delight, I discovered from the English ambassador to the Netherlands yesterday that the picture I've been looking for, which is of her in a blue dress with the same jewel on, is hanging in the ambassador's residence at, uh, um, uh, at The Hague. And he's invited me for tea, so um, I can go and uh, look at the picture. Now, I think I'm actually um, going... Uh, I wonder what picture I gave you. Oh, good. Um, I gave you the jewel again. I think I'm going to stop there in, in, in a, any sort of prepared piece because um, this is in 1641. In 1642, civil war is declared by the king, war against his people by the king in England, and he packs his wife, Henrietta Maria, and his daughter, Mary Stuart, off to her in-laws in the Netherlands. And one of the great accusations against Henrietta Maria was she took the crown jewels with her and pawned them to raise troops to support her husband's cause. Now, I doubt they pawned this piece, but there's no doubt that this piece then went back to The Hague in 1642 where it, um, and, and stayed with the Princess Royal. I'd love to find it on another um, uh, frock or in another painting uh, from later in this story. But what I want that just to evoke for you 
For one thing is that Gaspar Duarte is always described as a picture dealer. And in fact, it was from him and from other picture dealers like him that the paintings were acquired by the Dutch um, States General to give to Charles II as the so, I forget what it's called, the king's gift, or that, they, that he was given in 1660 to, the paintings to take back to England to reestablish a royal collection of art after, at the end of the Civil War. Um, but Duarte was simply a luxury goods dealer, and his clients, as ever and, or for, and forever, were, was, were any of those who could afford his services and could afford to visit his workshops or shops um, wherever they were. And as a final indication of the way in which that might alter our attitude to the movement of luxury goods and the way that they might percolate into the mentality and temperament of a people or several peoples, um, in an inventory of Gaspar Duarte's paintings of 1683 after his death, uh, made by his son, one of them, the most precious in fact, a Raphael painting, which is valued at 2,000 pounds, the note on the inventory said that it was acquired from a Spanish prince in exchange for a ring to the same value containing a large uncut diamond at its center that the Spanish prince wanted rather more than his Raphael. And that might remind you that uh, uh, 2,000 pounds for a Raphael is an enormous sum of money. The average painting is much more like 200 pounds. But these gemstones are changing hands at prices way above the great works of art that we now see in the Moritz House and the Rijksmuseum and, um, and so on. But this is the texture, if you like, the weft that underlines the story that Russell's going to ask me about, about how this to and fro percolation, remember I was talking about the 1640s, how by 1680, my argument is that the English and the Dutch, as they confronted each other on what might have been a battlefield, recognized each other's culture, recognized each other's temperament and mentality, and that that somehow eased that regime change from the Stuarts to the House of Orange um, in a way that, let's say, um, other invasions, you might think only of Iraq, were not eased by a meeting of cultures, but by a clash of cultures. So I think that I'll leave it there, Russell, and uh, get you to quiz me. And can I get down off this box? Well, thank you very much for that. Um, let me ask you first about, uh, you begin your book, I don't know, the first 50 pages or more. Is that the end of it you read? No, 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 I'm <laughs> starting at the beginning. Um, talk, now I have to prove it, right? Um, with the, what the English call the Glorious Revolution. Yes. Which, in a way, is the end of the story that you tell. Yes. So um, maybe you can summarize the, what the glorious, re what purpose that serves for your argument, yeah. and then also move forward in time and give us a sense of uh, uh, what moved forward from there, what kind of legacy or, or what one can see that came out of this whole period of, of cross-fertilization that, that, that lives on. Okay, can I change that question? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, to start with the glorious revolution, now, um, I. I take it that most of my audience are, is either Dutch or North American. Am I right in that? Do we have any English in the audience? Oh, we have some wow, Brits. Thank that. God for that, right? It's just that you know very well that, the, um, that North American history won't have taught anybody about the Glorious Revolution. Um, uh, and I did find, and the Dutch, but whereas the Dutch do know about the Glorious Revolution. Um, uh, in 1688, in, on November the 5th, 1688, uh, William III of Orange landed at Torbay with a massive force of soldiers from a fleet that was, I think, five times as big as the Armada, um, which had evaded the English fleet because it, of a tactical error. The English were very good at tactical errors. The, the, the English fleet was in Gravesend in the, in the mouth of the Thames, and the wind, which the Dutch referred to as a providential wind, which uh, 
spun, at enormous speed, spun the Dutch fleet past uh, the Thames estuary uh, and round the bottom, you can see I'm not a geographer, the bottom of England to uh, Torbay, um, that same wind was blowing so as to keep the English fleet holed up at the mouth of the Thames. It was blowing into the mouth of the Thames, and this is a period of sailing ships. They couldn't get out, so it went all the way round. Um, and uh, similarly, the English army had been rallied home to London because James II was so frightened, the Catholic king was so frightened of uprising internally that he mm -hmm. preferred to have the troops at home. So William of Orange landed in what was supposed to be a rescue operation to rescue Protestant England from its Catholic monarch, who was becoming increasingly totalitarian and increasingly insistent after an early burst of toleration um, on filling all prominent positions with paid up Catholics and basically um, altering the constitution um, of England to, Sounds, okay, and, um, uh, and that was a full, fully fledged invasion. It was military, it was naval, um, it would have been violent, except it was raining so hard that most of the English stayed at home. But I mean, it was, it was a forced march from Tor Torbay to London. Um, it, and, f and I think the best way of capturing it is that for 18 months after the invasion, um, Dutch soldiers were posted on every government building in London, and no English troops were, allow were allowed within 20 miles of the capital. And yet, let me just, uh, and yet, uh, English, this is a great historic case of spin doctrine. The English don't see it that way, and you just told me earlier that the one thing, that, that, that in England, the reception of the book has been people have not had a very hard time with the idea that there is a Dutch cultural influence. Yeah, they in, love that. But they that, just don't believe but the they idea were invaded. Of inva invasion. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> They're absolutely certain. Okay, they so how, invaded. how did the spin doctoring happen? Um, well, um, it, it happened. I mean, it, it was. It was. I mean, it was brilliant. It was strategically brilliant, but it was also it had been coming, if you like, for a long while. I mean, um, uh, having once decided to invade, William used a team of English-born spin doctors. Mm -hmm to write to fabulous pamphlets, which have actually influenced his historians right down to the present day, um, uh, insisting that he was only coming to save England mm -hmm. from Catholicism, that he didn't intend to reign, that this was going to be completely peaceful. So this is classic uh, propaganda. Classic propaganda, yes, yeah. and, and it was issued, and, and classically, um, and the Dutch have always been very good at this. It was, I mean, because William the Silent had done the same thing um, a generation earlier. It was issued in five different languages and distributed right across Europe so that everybody had got this mm -hmm. message. Um, the, uh, the second thing was that there was no set battle, pitched battle. There was no patch pitched naval battle. And that all allows the military historians to say that there was no um, battle. I, I, I guess if the enemy runs away, mm -hmm. um, that doesn't count. Um, um, uh, but thirdly, and that's the theme of my book, um, as, I, as I ended up my little introduction, there was this sense of a meeting of minds and cultures. And I capture that in my opening by this lovely story that, I, that I, for the opening chapters, I used the Dutch diary of Constantine Huygens Jr., Sir Constantine, the Sir Constantine of the Gem story, his son, who was the first secretary to William and traveled over with him, with William III, um, uh, got seasick on the voyage, hated sleeping on the floor of a house when he arrived in Torbay. Um, but as they, were, as they approached Salisbury, uh, William in the pouring rain, William III said, we have to go and look at the gardens of Wilton. I've seen pictures of it, it's wonderful. <laughs> and um, uh, Constantine preferred to go to bed. William went and um, looked at the gardens, uh, came back and told um, Constantine he absolutely had to go, then went down with a terrible cold, which rather tells us he really did go around the gardens. Um, but that lovely idea that in the midst of battle, as it were, and on a campaign, having seen the pictures in your tourist guide of a Dutch garden in England, you should want to go and do that. <laughs> so, and, and you know, the detail is so lovely and it doesn't lend itself. Uh, the ideas lend themselves to this kind of presentation. The detail, as I could feel as I tried to give you one, they don't really sing in, in, to a, a, um, in this kind of gathering, but the details are really 
fabulous. And as you say, I've been privileged to be allowed to have the pictures to show just how fabulous mm -hmm. some of your students mm -hmm. think. Mm -hmm. so. so you, d in the book, you use uh, a piece of jewelry, uh, artwork, uh, elements of garden design, tulip bulbs, uh, uh, scientific instruments, uh, clocks. Uh, um, I'm, I, first of all, I'm asking uh, about your method. You, it's, a, it's broad cultural method where you're taking examples from every element. Uh, but also, you're, uh, why, why these two countries? Why was this, there this level of exchange between these two countries? And, and presumably, there wasn't that level between England and France? Or well, first of all, I would say that far more work has been done on England and France. Um, and, the, and, and there's a curious way in but which... But nobody says England is really, you know... A, a French. A result, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I must be careful here. Um, uh, there was at the begin what was the beginning of your question? When you said... Oh, uh, I was uh, talking about all the different areas. Okay, yes, the different. My magpie mind, perhaps. Um, uh, I had been assembling, as I wrote my other books, literally since Ingenious Pursuits, which was about the scientific revolution, so moved into the 17th century. I'd been a 16th century -ist until then. Um, as I moved into the 17th century, and as I read all of this work about what went on in country and country and country, and I thought, okay, well, in the 16th century, there weren't nation states, and I didn't think there were nation states till the 18th century, so why are we carving up all these areas I'm interested in, like scientific instruments? And why am I only allowed to look at and books and that I read at scientific instruments in, in England when I know that people were crossing the channel. It was a great deal easier and safer to cross the channel in 1650 in a boat than it was to ride from The Hague to Paris, which was a very unpleasant, long, and dangerous journey. So people forget that water was easier to travel on. So there's actually a closer connection. Mm -hmm. that, no, that, mm -hmm. that might be my first answer. Mm -hmm. um, England was a... Geography. Geography, some of it's geography, and some of it is is tides and winds. Mm -hmm. If you leave the Hague on a sailing vessel, um, exactly as William had planned, you are either swept up to the Firth of Forth around the east coast, which you get to if the wind is blowing in that direction, staggeringly quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and there's tremendously close connections between the Scottish along the Firth of Forth and um, the Dutch, but that was another story I didn't, wasn't mm -hmm. able to write. Or you uh, would go west, um, uh, notionally to the, to into the Thames Estuary. That was also reasonably quick. If you were lucky, it was reasonably quick. You hung around, it was just like going to airports now. You hung around for days, but once you actually got on a boat, it was really quick. Um, so uh, geography is, is, a, is, is one start. The accidents of migrations of people because of the English civil wars is a really major factor. It, and when the civil war broke out in 1642, although I was taught at school that the royalists went to France because of Henrietta Maria, you could not attend Anglican church service in France. You could attend Anglican church service in Antwerp and in Amsterdam, and in Antwerp in particular. So there's a religious uh, so, well, so, it, so religious there, there was a, a comfort mm -hmm. one. So if you and then in 1660, uh, when the royalists went home carrying all their Dutch habits, and if they were men with Dutch wives, and by that time probably Dutch children, because they didn't know. You know, we think it was obvious that the king was going to come back in 1660. These people had settled for good in Holland, and then they went home. And Alexander Bruce's wife. Um, Veronica van Arsens van Sommelsdijk, who was the daughter of the, most, the richest man in The Hague, did not like it at all that she had to go back and live in the Firth of Forth. Um, and she planted tulips there, hopefully, um, but they didn't really thrive. And she wrote to her mother saying how damn cold it was. But no, they didn't expect to go back. And when they went back, the Commonwealth men and women, they came to mm -hmm. Holland now because they would, they, they, so you get two ideology, ideological sweeps in two generations, and they all wind up in the Low Countries. And you have this remarkable situation where the English court is in The Hague. And not just yeah. one, but there are actually two English courts. Well, there are actually three okay. courts. No, I mean, what two are, are English. And there's, there's the, well, the, uh, so, um, you know, remember, Little Mary arrives in 1642. Um, 
Uh, by 47, Frederick Hendrick is dead, and so she and her teenage husband are um, Stadtholder and wife and live like uh, royalty, absolutely in a court in The Hague. Um, her, their mother, in, her mother-in-law, his mother, Amalia van Solms, who was the widow of um, Frederick Hendrick, had been a lady-in-waiting to um, Princess Elizabeth, so Elizabeth, Queen of Bohemia, Princess Elizabeth, who was Charles I's sister, another English woman. Amalia also emulated, also wanted a royal court, also emulated an English court. Um, and what's my third one? Oh, and then there is Elizabeth of Bohemia's own court uh, after um, Frederick had died, had lost Bohemia, and uh, Frederick had died. And she comes back to The Hague, and she establishes a third English court. Mm -hmm. so, and the language is spoken at those, all three of those courts um, are English and French, with Dutch on sufferance. Mm -hmm. um, to what extent, back to the Glorious Revolution, uh, it, it was certainly important to the English that the, their invader's wife was English. Yes. I mean, to what extent was, yes. was that uh, uh, convenience? <laughs> or, okay. to, or to uh, what extent was it, is it legitimate to say this was not an invasion at all? This is a, this is a, a sort of religious uh, taking back what is what, what is, is theirs. Ours. Well, um, now we have the dynastic story. There's the political story. Um, how many people know about the warming pan plot? Oh, good. Well, that's really good. I'm really happy. Okay. She came with you. That's what she <laughs> came with me. She doesn't count. Um, thank you. Thank you. The warming, plan, the warming pan plot <clears throat> runs as follows. Until, so uh, James II, I really apologize for all this English history, and, um, but no, I don't. That's what we're here for. That's what we're here for, that's right. J it's just, it's quite complicated. The book has lots of family trees, right? Um, James II succeeded his brother, Charles II. The Stuarts were very bad at having legitimate children, dozens of illegitimate children. Um, James II succeeded Charles II in 1685. By 1687, he's, his reign was felt to be oppressive. His wife, Mary of Modena, had not raised a child successfully above babyhood. Really sad, and these royal women spent their entire time pregnant. I mean, um, Anne, oh, you see, I digress. Queen Anne, I think, had seven pregnancies or 17 pregnancies and never bore a living child, mm -hmm. you know. Um, it was your job to produce an heir, and you were just either pregnant or grieving a lost baby. Um, so it is not true to say that Mary of Modena had had no children. Um, and indeed, 1677, the year that William II that married the little girl, uh, uh, sorry, move on one, the, the, that their little boy, William III, married Mary Stuart. I have to go back on that, because I got that wrong. Right. The little boy and the little girl, had a son, William, it's really annoying. <laughs> Another William, who was to be um, William III. Uh, in 16, he was born in 1650, two weeks after his father's death. Um, in 1677, he married James II's eldest daughter, so cousin marriage. Um, and they were allowed to marry because the House of Orange was thought of as extremely inferior and not really up to Stuart standards um, because at that moment Mary of Modena had a baby boy who had been cr christened in fact um, uh, the, li the, uh, William and the new William and Mary um, stood godparents to the little boy who I think was called Henry um, but he died within a year uh, so she had no living children in, uh, sh in, 16, in July 1688 she gave birth to a healthy boy which none of the Protestant British believed was her baby. Um, and nor did uh, Mary's sister Anne. Mary's sister Anne, who was at court, who would become Queen Anne, um, all through the pregnancy, is writing to her sister Mary in The Hague, saying, she won't let me feel her stomach, she looks far too well, she's getting big too quickly, I don't believe this. And so it's called the warming pan plot because it was believed that the midwife had smuggled a baby into the delivery room and smuggled out the either 
non-existent baby. <laughs> I mean, either there was no baby or there was another stillbirth because she'd had such a succession of still. This was a really rollicking, healthy boy <coughs> who was, of course, heir to the throne, Catholic heir to the throne. Now, until the day he was born, a live birth, <coughs> Mary Stuart in the Netherlands was heir to the throne. And next after her was her sister Anne. Um, and after them was William of Orange. So he was fourth in line to the throne, and in fact, because he didn't, he was a bit of a misogynist, didn't acknowledge female inheritance, he actually thought he was heir to the throne. But the minute that baby boy was born, that was all out the window. The minute that little boy was born, um, uh, Mary Ann and William moved down one. Mm -hmm. And at that point, he knew he had to invade. Okay, but uh, for, for a British commoner, to what extent were they, did they feel that they'd had enough of this Catholic king and they would welcome this, uh, uh, what yeah. was not an invita uh, invasion, Invi but in fact uh, yeah. a Stuart <laughs> coming a Stuart. back well, under the throne? Well, um, nobody Stuart. wanted civil war. That's the most, I mean, there had been civil war in, in, uh, 16, in the 1640s. Nobody wanted civil war. Um, how much did they want regime change? Um, I don't know. I don't know how to answer those questions. You know, people. The historians are very clear. They say there was a letter of invitation from uh, seven. Is it seven or six? Seven of the seven. Thank you. Seven of the great and the good uh, wrote to William and said, "Would you please come and rescue us from this um, <coughs> from this Catholic menace?" And what I am saying on my tour is. Now, let me see. If seven men in the Baghdad opposition government had written to George Bush and said, we're really, uh, Saddam Hussein is appalling, would you please come and rescue us? Would that have not been an invasion then when it happened? Bush would have argued Bush, it was an invitation. Bush would have argued it was an, an invitation. It makes it no less an invasion. We're mm -hmm. talking semantics, really. Mm -hmm. What did ordinary people in England feel? I, I find it very hard to say because it was in the elite that the effect of his Catholicism was having the most, mm -hmm. making the most difference. It was, it was for them that questions of who was going to be master of a college or who was going mm -hmm. to be, get this job or who was going to get this um, uh, tax break was now being handed out to Catholics. I think it would have been, I think myself, it would have been another generation before that reached crisis. Mm -hmm. If it did, mm -hmm. it, or might, we might have been Catholic out in the present day, mm -hmm. who knows. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 don't, I, I don't like to let William off the hook by saying, well, actually, we all wanted him to come. But I do, but do you see that that's not the same as saying that culturally we were ready to uh, embrace him? because we had become so close to the Dutch in so many okay, ways. Okay, now that's what I want to ask you about next. The cultural, uh, y your overall point that uh, there grew to be this dense cultural mm -hmm. back and forth yeah. between these countries. Um, and I can understand that. On the other hand, when I, when I uh, did my own research in this period, I often found myself drawing the opposite conclusion. That is, the, the, the pamphlets of the, of the day were, uh, were sort of the newspapers or the, 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 ways, the standard way of getting information out. And the pamphlet, there were three tr wars fought between mm. 1650 and 1674. Um, and the pamphlets written are just excruciatingly, uh, 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 they, can, they get scatological about yes. the other. And I just, uh, to quote the title of one, a, a English uh, pamphlet, on the Dutch men's pedigree, or a relation showing how they were first bred and descended from a horse turd, which was enclosed in a butter box. Um, the English didn't like the Dutch. What date One was might, that? What date yeah, was I don't that? have the date here. I don't. I'm because like you with me. Uh, I'd have to look it <laughs> um, up. But uh, and then all the derogatory terms: Dutch, oh, Dutch, uh, going Dutch. No, Dutch no, no. I have to. I have to keep saying this, right? I, and it me it must mean something. It must be differently used in North America, I think. Of all the Dutch, you know, Dutch uncle, mm -hmm. Dutch courage. courage, Dutch auction, Dutch, the, well, that's the only one, that's not it, the only one that is in English, uh, meaning British usage, not even slightly derogatory, is going Dutch. Okay, so that's a bit different. It's Fair different, enough. yeah. But, uh, but going but Dutch just means let's split the cost. Right, of course. Right. But and my boys and girls. But it has an undertone of, uh, of, 
of no, it doesn't. Treatment. No, it doesn't have an undertone of treatment. I insist. It's okay. what boys and okay. girls they go out for the first time to the cinema. Nobody goes to the cinema anymore. Or they uh, and 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 they get to the cash de the, to the desk and they say, "Let's go Dutch," right? right. Um, and that's a completely without edge in right. Japanese. Okay, but my point is, there was a lot of animosity yeah. between these two yeah. countries okay. at the same time. So the how do you reconcile? Okay. Those two well, I, I think we do talk levels. We do. We mm -hmm. do talk First of all, I think pamphlet wars are always scatological and always. I mean, you. I, I might as well say to you that all those pamphlets of Williams about how much the British loved him coming and all the people writing saying, "Oh, we welcome him with open arms." They too are not a reflection of. So, but you're saying it's all propaganda because it seems no, no, I'm not saying propaganda. I'm saying some sections of a community, those who are played to, mm -hmm. just the way mm -hmm. I might read the Guardian and someone on the tube next to me might be reading the Sun, and mm -hmm. the headline will be, um, uh, you know, like we know when we bombed the when the British shamefully bombed the Argentinians, and the Guardian said, you know, Belgrano bombed, and the Sun said, got them. <laughs> in huge, bold type, you know, that's the difference. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, uh, there were three Dutch wars and they were commercial wars, mm -hmm. and they had very little impact on everyday life in Britain, except that your goods tended to get lost if they were in transit, mm -hmm. um, because your ship might get sunk, mm -hmm. um, or, and it was inconvenient for travel. But, and and um, I guess I would say I could find the pro-Dutch eulogy for every anti-Dutch mm -hmm. pamphlet, mm -hmm. And I tend to think pamphlets, we, for a long time, historians who were wedded to text, to things written down, uh, used, used pamphlets to the exclusion of other things to, for, to frame certain sort of history. I think that's past, and I think that um, watching how material goods move and how they're recorded and who buys and sells is, another, is a way of trying mm -hmm. to get, get at it from another angle, mm -hmm. which is, all I'm trying to do is give another angle, not mm -hmm. a total picture, mm -hmm. but another mm -hmm. angle. Uh, the the overall notion that England has sort of Dutch genes, um, uh, culturally speaking, uh, can can you say the opposite? Uh, uh, because in the book, it's n it's presented not so much as w uh, pictures and objects and other el uh, elements of culture going moving from the Dutch Republic to England, but back Both and forth. Back and forth. So can you not make a similar claim and say that the Dutch are are uh, have English? cultural stock in them as well. Yes, I think we've just gr grooved together. Mm -hmm. But, and I'm not saying, I mean, this was a, mo a historical moment, or quite a long moment. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I don't think this happened continuously, although I love it when people come up at book signings um, uh, in Britain and they all tell me about their Dutch relation mm -hmm. people. You know, I mean, it's just completely fantastic um, how many people have Dutch ancestry mm -hmm. of somewhere in their, in their history, as they do in the United States, mm -hmm. many people do in the United States. Um, uh, um, but I think that the Dutch would always knew that they accepted outside influences. I'm not sure the English. So in, in other words, it's in terms of telling a story, the mm -hmm. more surprising story mm -hmm. is the one about, mm -hmm. um, about England. Mm -hmm. And I'm having a problem because I'm thinking of art. And given that every single painter in Restoration England was Dutch, not Dutch influenced, but Dutch. <laughs> I'm having a hard job seeing what England could give back. <laughs> right? Okay, in that arena, right. Um, and to some extent with garden design, you know, all mm. the great English gardens were designed by great Dutch gardeners, mm. occasionally a French one. They all sort of influenced each other and then English garden design went back to Holland, but since it was started out as Dutch, mm -hmm. you know, so they get, no, they get modulated as they move, as they move to and fro. Mm. Okay, so in the course of the 17th century, you have these two rival empires, and one of them over the course of the century rises and yeah. falls. The other one rises and then keeps rising into until the 20th falls. century. Until so, di well, until it falls. But did the did the Dutch do something wrong, or were they just less? Uh, no, you know, I, I, I do exploitative and now less this is good yes. No, no, they were not less anything. They just weren't paying attention. <laughs> um, uh, as I think. Um, cult, uh, civiliz not civilized, uh, nations. I don't like using nations. Uh, anyone who reads my book will discover that it's, the, it's not the right term, but let's, we're going to have to use it because we've got to distinguish these two. Um, uh, in at, at their height and buoyancy, nations tend not to notice the things that are slipping away from them. Mm -hmm. um, and economic um, dominance and uh, I, I mean, when I, I, I guess, was slipping away from mm -hmm. Holland. Uh, and some of that lost 
is part of your story mm -hmm. about uh, North America, your, mm -hmm. the, story, the story you told so wonderfully in Ireland at the centre of the world. Um, some of that loss was um, territorial and uh, some of it was um, naval, and actually, and so after the era of the great Dutch naval commanders, and some of it was commercial and some of it was economic. But everything seemed still to be going so well Plus, the King and Queen of England came back and visited regularly. They spent their summers at Het Lo. They, um, they actually preferred being in the Netherlands. So there was this illusion mm -hmm. that you were at the center of things. And, um, by the, and long before the 1750 setting out of the boundaries of the nation states, Holland had lost that position mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. was in decline. Mm -hmm. um, that doesn't mean they've done anything wrong. They've, it's moved, it's moved away from them. Actually, poignantly, for those British people here will know this, you know, Britain has just lived through 10 years when we truly believed we were controlling the economy and doing brilliantly. And now that we've gone into quasi-recession, we're told by the government they can't control it, we can never control the economy. So that, the going up <laughs> must have been an accident too. Um, and, um, and that tends to be the case, that people, that governments, they can't mm -hmm. control their decline. They, mm -hmm. they were in control as they were. But there were two very different styles of empire as well. Uh, yes, but then there have been very different styles yeah. of empire. Um, Holland, like Portugal, did not particularly want territory. Mm -hmm. They liked mm -hmm. being small and compact. Mm -hmm. um, those were very successful empires because they were they 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 um, their strength was their commerce. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Britain liked whole swathes of the map to be painted pink. Mm -hmm. And to be speaking English. And to, spe and to be speaking English. Mm -hmm. um, and those are really hard to keep hold of because mm -hmm. it involves um, a, whole, a whole cadre of people to be sent out to look after them, not to mention supply networks. And I mean, the one I remember is that the 15th century Portuguese empire collapsed because it got so big that they literally could not supply the edges of their empire. Mm -hmm. I think that also happened to the Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. So if you mm -hmm. if you insist on territorial yeah. gain, you collapse quicker. Mm -hmm. But the small. And However, the British Empire went on to went, went much longer. The Dutch Empire has a had a. You're really down on the Dutch. I no um, no no. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just trying to. I think the Dutch our Empire did just. Well, it's it's it was um, wonderful. Uh, and and maybe I maybe I think I was just about to have the thought, which I haven't had before, so I may not get it quite right. Perhaps if you are not a cult, uh, if you, perhaps if you are not a territorial empire, you invest more lovingly in your cultural um, export. Mm. In which case, and you see, I am trying to say that Holland didn't fail. She lost her position, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but she succeeded yeah. in permanently influencing culture. Now, maybe that's a thesis that I didn't quite have in the book, but might be worth thinking about. Mm -hmm. which okay, so, permanently, so there was this cross-cultural uh, influence which lived on, on, in a global sense, through the British. Yes. And, and give us some examples of it. Um, of, 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 you know, something that was sort of originally Dutch. Uh, that Bank of England. That's a good. Um, uh, I mean, um, sophisticated. I mean, I'll, I'll do that one because it's not the one you expected. Just because, just, and then I'll come to the. Because um, I want you to know it's serious. You know, mm -hmm. um, uh, one of the things that Holland didn't know it was, it had mislaid and lost when William took off for London was his key bankers and financial advisors who went to London um, and who established and who found that the, um, that the English um, monetary system was quaint in the extreme. So Isaac Newton believed that it was wrong to issue a silver coin whose weight in silver, whose silver content did not exactly match its face value. The Dutch understood that if you did that, all your silver would be withdrawn from cir circulation and melted down, and that you needed alloy in your coin um, if it was to circulate. The English learned that from the Dutch. Um, they learned about um, paper banking, um, and I got a banknote out to show um, one of the journalists uh, I was um, being interviewed by today to show that an English banknote, I don't know about a Dutch banknote, an English banknote still says at the top, pay to the bearer the sum of 
10 pounds, signed by the head of the Bank of England. So that piece of paper, you could walk to the Bank of England and they would have to give you 10 pounds worth of silver mm -hmm. for it. Um, the use of paper money um, it came, comes from the Far East, but it came through Holland. The Bank of England was set up under, under um, in 1690, might be 92, because I say I'm a bit wobbly on those. 94, Nin 94 thank you very much. Um, sorry? Thank you. Bank of Scotland in 95. But the Bank of, uh, I don't know uh, whether that was on the same model, but the Bank of England in 94 was robustly Dutch in its model and it was financed with Dutch money. Um, so that's a good start. And then banking goes on being, you know, I, as we know, you know, we're still the financial. I mean, mm -hmm. that's why we keep, that's why we managed to keep the Greenwich Meridian in London because it suits the banking community <laughs> that that be their zero. Um, so you could take, um, well, give me one, start me off on one. Um, uh, well, art or science? Art, so, I'd rather do science, thank you. Because so, some of you will know that my, in my heart, I'm still a scientist. I trained, as you should believe this, 100 years ago, I trained as a scientist. Um, and um, uh, I love showing people that early science is just as exciting as early art dealing and, um, and music and so on. Um, the, the Dutch, were the, the, the Dutch were the great technical instrument makers. They could make a, a milled cog, a mass-produced cog, um, to a precision that nobody else could. And they, the, the artisan work in, in Holland was remarkable, and I think that's because of the high education level that Holland's always been famous for. That if you, because I'm a teacher, I believe if you educate people enough, they can do anything, even with their hands. Um, so clocks and micrometers and measures and all of the equipment that's needed for precise science started in the Netherlands um, and they uh, bred a generation of scientists like Christian Huygens, Constantine Jr.'s brother and Constantine Sr.'s second son um, who began to make clocks and look for longitude um, and so on. And they corresponded with the New Royal Society in 1660 in London, whose members, many of them, had learnt their practical skills in the Netherlands, like um, Sir Robert Murray, who'd been in Maastricht during the revolution and who had learned stonemasonry there, exact measurement, and came back and wrote a history of trades mm -hmm. in, in Britain, was also an astronomer and um, microscopist. Um, and it was then... Britain that carried, that took that tradition forward mm -hmm. into what we call the scientific revolution. But I have no doubts at all, and would, will, I'm quite happy to give chapter and verse, that the origins of that were laid mm -hmm. in the instrument making in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. um, I, I'd like to ask you a few biographical questions and then uh, open it up for people to, to ask questions. Um, Lisa Jardine is the daughter of Jacob Bronowski, the uh, legendary um, uh, historian of science and public intellectual who uh, is most famous for the series The Ascent of Man in the, in the 1970s. And it strikes me, first of all, that you followed very closely in your father's footsteps in terms of being a public intellectual. And um, I think about that, and I, I guess the, the question I have is, in those days, in, I probably, I guess in the US at the time, it was Carl Sagan. Yes, was, it was. Um, uh, and it, and they, were, they, they had this sort of optimistic sense of, of science, of, of humanism, of, of, of what the possibilities were. Is it uh, very different today, being a public intellectual? Um, well, first of all, I would say that, um, you know, I grew up in a household in which I could not but absorb all of those um, uh, strands. And, you know, Carl Sagan came in and out of our house, and mm -hmm. Francis Crick came in and out of our house, and um, uh, Jonas Salt came in and out, you know, I mean, so it was a sort of ambience in which you be pretty optimistic, I think. <laughs> um, uh, um, I'm hugely optimistic still. Um, I have no problem with being optimistic on the basis of all that I know and have learned. Um, is it different uh, being... I guess what I mean is, is the, the culture itself seems to be less, to sort of buy less the notion that, yes, well, if we, if we follow our scientists follow our universities, yeah. follow, you know, th th then we will progress. 
Well, remember, I teach in the university, so I'm a little bit sheltered from real life, perhaps, in this respect. But um, uh, I don't find it to be so. I find many of our newspapers to say so. I don't mm. find it to be so. I took on this big uh, government job um, in April. I actually was offered it in at the end of January, and I had no hesitation in taking this role as literally the arbitrator between science and ethics on uh, the use of um, artificial um, for t for, uh, of all, I mean, we regulate in Britain absolutely all um, artificial reproduction. So anybody who has treatment for infertility and is, we, we monitor that their treatment is ethically sound. Um, so I face the scientists on a day, and then we also do the same for stem cell research, which I am proud to say uh, Britain allows to be conducted within very, very, very strict limits mm -hmm. on embryonic material. And we regulate that as well, and that's another huge ethical issue. And I do that, you'd have to be an optimist to do that. Um, I do that in the absolute belief that n almost all I'd say all, but then you'd say, no, that couldn't be right. Almost all scientists are people of extraordinary integrity be to be trusted. Almost all people who run fertility clinics have nothing but the best interests mm -hmm. of their um, patients at heart. And that my job is to just make sure that we walk hand in hand and keep that project um, within bounds that the public at large is prepared to um, accept as being admissible with all their creeds and um, beliefs and so on. So I absolutely believe that we're headed in that direction. Um, uh, in the, uh, and, and actually, no questions from the audience will dent me in that, but they can try. Thank you. Well, with that, <laughs> <laughs> are there questions? Yes. Okay, that's a nice question. Does domesticity come from the Dutch? The idea of domesticity. Now, it's a lovely question because I hadn't thought of it that way, but I think that's what I'm trying to say about the way, when I talk about the way, that when the English went to the Netherlands after, during the Civil War, they found that ordinary professional people had paintings on their walls and rugs on their floor, and bought and sold consumer goods, and planted tulips in their garden. And that that was, that there were, in other words, that there was a visible culture like that, that in Britain you saw amongst the elite, uh, with the aristocracy, that, it, that, that there was a, you know, a, a thoroughly, um, in, well, I, you see, I can't say that. You can say middle class. I can't say middle class. I'm a historian. I have to say middling sort. But I think it's professional people. Um, because um, So I think there is some truth in that. And I, cause, Because what I do say is that when the English came back after the Civil Wars, they realized that you were entitled to have art on your walls without having to be a member of the ruling elite. And you know, then you have people like Pepys, uh, commissioning paintings, and that's in a strong Dutch tradition. So the household, as, 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 that, as that kind of, uh, of locus of family life, yes, I think that the Dutch model did, and I hadn't thought of that before, and so thank you very much. That I've, I'm, te I'm trying to avoid the gaze of my the technical, technical director of my in institute, Dr. Broadway, who's in the front row, who is a family historian of the 17th century in England, who will tell me afterwards that that was rubbish, but I'm not going to, um, I, 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 I like the idea and I think that in my cultural travels, I think, you know that when the aristocracy from England arrived in Holland, they said, butchers have paintings on their walls, <laughs> you know, have, you know, how um, uh, inappropriate. So there was a sense that there was a way of life that, and you know, that's in Vermeer's paintings and um, captured there, and uh, so yes, I think that's right. Thank you. I'm very grateful for your work in science and in politics, and you made me aware of the fact that there are actually studies going on in France for the last year on the connection of religion to crime, uh, only about religion in the years when I was in France. Um, my question is whether you can shed some light on why 
Okay, um, do you mind if I have a little side exposition about? Um, um, we have a remarkable system in Britain which has been emulated in Australia and New Zealand. And I didn't know about it until I was interviewed for this <coughs> job, um, which is that uh, Britain runs these very difficult areas uh, wi in which the science is moving extraordinarily fast. Um, using something which is called arm's length legislation uh, in conjunction with a regulator, which is, as you say, an a body independent of government, which must be chaired by a lay person, if you wondered why on earth a Renaissance historian would be chairing the Human Fertility and Embryology Authority. It must be chaired by a lay person, which is in itself a rather beautiful idea, that I would have no interest in clinic or stem cell, or even fertility treatment. Um, uh, though it turns out every single one of us has someone we know who uh, is undergoing or has undergone either successful or unsuccessful treatment. It is getting close now to one in six of couples in Britain will experience difficulty with um, producing children. Um, the, the issue that, yes, I think the last people who should make these decisions are politicians. Um, if the press is here, it's a good thing that our new legislation has just gone, completed its journey through Parliament. I was not allowed to speak about this until now, um, and not a, to express that kind of opinion, because, um, because I am the external regulator, and in um, May of this year, very content, there were very um, contentious debates about very many of the issues that you're dealing with here, but they were had in the press, and then it turned out that when the debates were had in, heard in Parliament, Parliament was very comfortable with the way we were doing it, and every single one of the attempts to restrict our freedom to make these decisions fell. Every single one of them was thrown out. So we remain a regulator. Arm's length legislation means that let's say on the issue of pre-implantation genetic testing of embryos, the law will say pre-implantation genetic testing of embryos may be used where there is extreme hereditary risk of, where there's risk of a, of a extreme condition which is carried on a single gene which is identifiable. So thalassemia and various um, illnesses which are now linked with a single gene. Um, so, uh, sorry, so the legislation says that. Um, we then have to interpret that law. So if a case comes before us concerning the breast cancer gene, this is now currently a problem because there is not a 100% chance that someone carrying that gene, with thalassemia there's a 100% chance that if you carry that gene, I mean it might be 90%, but it's, you know, let's call it 100%. Um, now there isn't, so there is a moral argument about whether if you do allow destruction, let's say it's a 60% chance, some say it's somewhere between 60 and 80, then there, that, that there, that, that tells you that you may, that may not be a moral thing to do. I'm not, believe me, I'm not taking sides in this at this point. I have to look at every, I, um, the HFEA has to look at each of these cases individually, and they will decide on the basis of the surrounding circumstances, the family conditions, the number of family members who have tragically died, whether it is admissible in this case and case by case we decide. And that gives the public confidence that none of these things are swept through the way that when politicians hit the table and say, 
if you allow this, then there will be monsters will be produced, there will be carnage and wholesale destruction of everything, or none of that happens if you have a regulator where, as I say, it sounds almost incredible, but every single case has to be brought before the, the regulator. Um, uh, but, so the, but the short answer is, although the parliamentarians in Britain spoke very eloquently in the end in favor of the regulator and against the attempts to restrict it, some of them still did hanker after more control over the field. I think it is not appropriate for politicians to control the fantastically fast, to, no, to take decisions in a field where nobody who is not a specialist can keep up with the implications and nobody but the most um, highly trained uh, um, mor uh, ethical eth ethicists or whatever we, and, and, uh, and experts in jurisprudence can decide or even begin to decide. There are never, by the way, right answers in these cases. There are the only the best case you can make under the circumstances. Now, I think an independent ethics committee would be a good start. Actually, ironically, we're resisting that in Britain because we think the regulator is enough. If you don't have a regulator, then I think you should try and have an independent ethics committee that stands between government dogma of various kinds. That's with, or, um, otherwise, you have to get, ask your government to look at the, what is now the HFEA has existed since 1990. Um, um, uh, you, to look at the record um, of nearly 20 years of that kind of regulation, um, which we are extremely proud of. I hope that didn't bore other, anybody. <laughs> other questions? Yes, sir. I won't um, answer at any great length. I'll just say that um, it was the same time period. It was right smack in the, the middle of the 17th century. And I would say both of those things were going on. They were, uh, that, which is why I posed the question before about, well, were these cultures really at odds or were they, because I think, as Lisa said, both of those things were going on at the same time. They were being influenced by one another. They were you know, at each other's throats. They were in North America, one at, on top of what became New York and the other on both sides of it is Virginia and New England. And uh, things developed very differently because there, because it was the Dutch who first uh, uh, laid claim to that piece of territory. And by the Dutch, I mean this mixed group that under Dutch auspices. And then it was taken over by the English. So that little area, Manhattan Island, became, it was, it was uh, uh, for quite a period of time, a node in both of these empires, the Dutch and then the, the British as well. That's, I'm not stealing any more of Lisa's <laughs> time. And I, use, I do use Russell's work in, my, uh, in a late chapter about North America.
Um, it is absolutely, I mean, I, I am ashamed to say I stop roughly in 1690 because I didn't want to do the Battle of the Boyne. <laughs> um, uh, it, it, the, the, the House of Orange in, given that the House of Orange, I mean, it's funny because, because here people see the Huygens family as being the, 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 the armature around which this book is built. Um, in England, where they don't know who the Huygenses are, um, they see it as being the House of Orange, um, the, which is slightly odd to make a small principality, I mean, a small set of princes your armature. I think they actually are the armature. And that meant that had I gone beyond 1690 and had I gone to the um, banking uh, foundation that I wanted to do, which if you read the book, you'll see that when I talk about George Downing, I really, really wanted to get onto the banking. Um, I just couldn't bring myself to have all those Irish um, responses um, because it's so polarized still and so, they're so sure the history of the oral record is correct that I didn't go there. Um, so the answer to that is I didn't go further. The other thing is, if you will forgive me for saying so, um, history of banking is really awful. Um, <laughs> Uh, and you can, and if you're writing a, a big synthetic book, as I was, the best you can do is the best of the best of your informants, because you are using them, and they're always all in my bibliography. And you have that, mm -hmm. had that too. Now, if you have a field like banking history, which is largely, forgive me for saying so, written by retired bankers, um, it's it, that was not a in any it, that was not a dig of any kind. It was just that, you know. The least helpful history of science is written by retired scientists. It, because it's your profession doesn't mean you necessarily, you have a training that's helpful um, for someone like me to integrate with the other histories. So, that's still left on my to-do list. Um, because actually I've had an interest in paper currency since I did Worldly Goods, um, where I had a section on the Fugger bankers and their, the impact that they had in Germany. So I've got one historian, if somebody knows really about the Bank of England over there and the Bank of Scotland, and I've got you uh, over there, and so I think I'll stop there on banking. <laughs> Tim. Too far. I mean, really too far. I mean, you know, uh, Russell tells such a brilliant story of how uh, ships would come into harbor of Manhattan and not know that everything had changed since the last mm -hmm. time they got there. I mean, um, I really love that. So, so that's why. Um, it, it, it was still a, a, an extremely complicated matter to take three ships in group, let alone an armada across the Atlantic Ocean. And I think it was a huge there. political decision, too, to, to, to take a, an armada the whole way across the ocean. And, 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 and the, the idea mm -hmm. that this was necessary and valuable to do, I think, I think that moment had passed, Did if it was ever. Like Did it, was it like the Falklands War? <laughs> I guess it could have been, yeah. Uh, some, yes, yeah. sir. <laughs> He's getting me back to banking. He Sorry? No.
I'm so sorry. But I have to say, that is one story. See, the great thing about our, we storytellers, of which this gentleman is clearly another, is that uh, there's the, um, there, there is in everyone's um, armory of stories, one story to be told to link two events in, ev in each person's um, his, uh, historical record. I, think. I mean, I'm not saying your story is wrong, I'm just saying I could tell you other stories. And I had an, uh, it, it, it's worth my saying to you that um, I had a terrible, a terrible, I had a battle with my publisher who wanted to call this book How Britain Plundered Holland's Glory, because they claimed it wouldn't sell in North America if it said England. Um, and I had to say, it has to say England, I don't do Scotland. Um, and um, and they, they found that just very hard to understand, that, that, that in this period you would need to treat those two. We're on the same page. <laughs> We're on the same page, that's right, all right. There's a, oh, there's one back there and then here. Yeah, Grace. <laughs> Sorry. started the evening with the fact that the, my, my English audience or British audience have been wonderfully receptive of that argument, which suggests to me that we've grown up um, uh, wonderfully open to the idea, in fact quite delighted and, and rather um, uh, charmed by that. As I say, the one thing they can't stomach is the invasion. Um, uh, um, so I think that I would say to you that the reception of my book has been, for me, evidence of a mature Britain. And the thing I didn't say when I was talking about my other role, and, um, and, and it came back to some, partly to your, your talk about propaganda, if there is one thing that deeply, deeply disappoints me in Britain at the moment, it's the state of the press, um, the published newspapers. Um, because the readers of my book all tell me how open they are to this idea, the wonderful idea of a pan-European influence of our all being, you know, in a world that is now so huge and full of such diverse peoples that we are all in Europe closer to each other than we think. And that's maybe, you know, you can sort of hear that European theme in all of my work, right? My family came from, you know, the, the a shtetl in Poland, and, you know, I like it in mainland, in Europe as a, I like it. And, um, but the press in England present, you know, shock, horror, scream, immigrants, spoiling our culture, ruining our country, day after day after day after day, and it must apparently sell newspapers, though I notice that actually, when I travel to work, the newspaper is bought in order that men can read the football results on the back and then throw it away, so maybe with luck they don't read that headline. But particularly in relation to our recent legislation, paper after paper said, shock, horror, shock, horror, let's get rid of this meddling authority, the government should ban all fertility treatment, it should ban this, it should ban that. And it didn't turn out to be what people were talking about. And that's maybe why I'm hostile to the idea of pamphlet. 